Your job as a photographer is to communicate what you're seeing, you know, whether it's on the front line or whether it's in Staten Island, Park Hill. For me, to begin with, being from North Dakota, and the whole reason I wanted to go into journalism and do this work is because I really just wanted to bring something back to pop these bubbles of, you know, the not really caring about anything besides like the football team. One of the powers of video, actually, um, beyond stills and writing, is there's a certain truth to it, or at least the audience believes there's a certain truth to it, that when you, when you, when you see it on film, it really happened. Maybe we can start with a, if you have any postscript to the postscript. Are you still in touch with the guys? And since you finished the film, uh, what's been going on with their lives? That's, we were actually just talking about this back in, in the green room. Um, you know, it's, it, it was very difficult to you know, keep in touch with, with these guys, especially um, with Hamid. He, let's see, last December he was in a really bad car accident and he was actually having to be medevaced out of Libya to Tunisia. He was in a coma for about a week. And after that, his family actually took him, his immediate family took him out and took him to Qatar. And he's been in Qatar since then. Um, I've spoken to his friends who all contact me to see if I've been able to get a hold of Hamid. And, you know, I have his number. I talk to his parents on Skype and Facebook. And I call and the phone shuffles around, then I never actually get him on the phone. So it's been almost a year since I've been able to actually speak to Hamid, but from other people I've been talking to, they say, you know, he actually was in a really bad place after that accident, everything that had been going on in Libya. So I think it's something, you know, he doesn't really want to have to talk about what he's been through again. Um. How did you find these guys? Uh, I mean, you, you committed a lot of time and you, um, the two of you, uh, you, you really uh, put yourselves in danger. So clearly you thought that these guys had a good story to tell. But early on, it's not always evident. You, you, so how did you find them? And at what point did you realize we're onto something? These are guys that are worth following and spending time with. Right. Um, you know, I worked with, working with dozens of young revolutionaries and trying to really see where their story was going. And I would talk to Tim, and we were discussing the, you know, what was actually happening in Libya and where it would be moving towards. And meeting Hamid and Tarek, you realize that these were the young kids that you would have sat next to in a college classroom. And I just wanted to know, you know, they had this life that I had and why did they decide that they wanted to leave everything behind and pick up a gun? And so, you know, when I told him about who they were, I could just tell from over the phone, he's like, okay, this is different. And so we decided that, you know, as the war, as it was really turning into a heavy war and they were heading towards the front line and they were really, the only ones I was following that story was continuing forward, that they would be the ones to really help tell a story that could take it outside of Libya and make people actually care about what was happening on the ground. And early on and then throughout, maybe you both can answer this, it, were there any kind of negotiations as far as when I say stop, you turn off the camera? What, what kind of, um, I guess, deal did you make? Because it's a strange concept having a camera follow you through your life. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we do. But it's still, I'm always amazed that people let us do it. Um, so how did you, particularly in some of the sensitive moments where clearly they're feeling vulnerable, um, did you set any ground rules in the beginning, or uh, was there a constant negotiation, or did you have to make adjustments throughout, or what, what kind of conversations did you have? You know, I think at the beginning was the, the most, but that was the moment where really you had to build the trust. And I had to spend time with Tarek and with his friends for about a week before I could even bring out my camera. And then when I was able to bring out my camera, I was only able to film from the nose down and they would check my footage to make sure, because they were worried about their family members in the western part of, of the country and what would happen to them if this footage got out anywhere. But once that initial trust was there, it really became, yeah, a constant, you know, kind of just monitoring how the day was going and if they were sensitive and just realizing, you know, at some point when you're living, I had to live with these guys, so you had to know that you couldn't have your camera on 24 hours a day. And when you really just, you needed to take a break or they needed a break, they just needed you to be there as a person rather than having a camera in their face. T Tim, you alluded to the fact that um, when you first started covering conflict, you were tagged along with uniformed soldiers who uh, ostensibly had training and kind of were disciplined and knew um, it's, it's always dangerous, but 
maybe some of those dangers were mitigated by the fact that they were trained soldiers. Um, and maybe you, you, could, you can also uh, speak to this, Ash. I, the, the fact that war is so different now, um, that we have these, these ethnic conflicts and these, um, these sectarian fights where, there's, where you have undisciplined and in some cases untrained uh, angry young men or, or going into battle, and you are tagging along with them, how is that a different experience? Well, that's a pretty broad question. Yeah. Um, I think, firstly, one thing I should establish here is that Rachel was the one on the ground. Okay. So during the seven months, um, Rachel was the one who was with these guys every single day. And the, I was in Brooklyn on Skype saying, don't go to the front line. <laughs> Whatever you do, trust me, I've done it for 15 years. It's not worth it. And one of the main reasons for saying that was because at this time was when um, every Buddy's telephone had a camera in it. And so these guys over there also had cameras in their phones and they were also taking small video cameras. And so this was one of the first times when the, these kids on the ground were filming themselves and they took the role of uh, documenting what they were doing and spreading the word, the word through the internet uh, as importantly as it was to have a gun. And um, so one of the one of the pieces of advice I was saying to Rachel was after 15 years of being on front lines, what, what do you really come away with? Yeah, I mean, uh, most of the time I'm down like this. I'm just hoping like this finishes and I get out alive. And, and at the end of the day, like how much of a story can we tell? This was kind of the genius of what Rachel did is that she turned the camera on once they came back from the front lines. And that's how you get that story. Uh, it's a good opportunity to broaden the discussion a little bit. And Rachel, one of the things I noticed was how beautifully everything was shot. You, you cared about light. You cared about composition. All of you have looked at all your work. It's, it's the same. Is there a conflict in making conflict beautiful? Is there, are you undercutting the severity? Or how do you, how do you sort of weigh beauty? I mean, I, I'm thinking of an image of yours, Ash, that I noticed the other day where um, there was a, a prisoner who was cowering against a wall. I think it was in Iraq. And you could see the shadow of the soldier who was watching him. Right. And it's it was a beautiful. The picture's called University of Jihad, motherfucker. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so, I mean, is there, is there an inherent conflict in? I don't think there's a conflict at all. I mean, your job as a photographer is to communicate what you're seeing, you know, whether it's on the front line or whether it's in Staten Island, Park Hill. Like, and when you're communicating, you need to communicate in a clear and concise manner, which is often uh, with, with photography, which often translates into something that you might call beautiful. Um, the light is pretty. The composition is strong. That doesn't mean the content of the picture is beautiful at all. But the picture itself has to be composed in a very strong manner in order to engage the reader. If I intentionally go out and shoot pictures that look crap, the, pic the reader is not going to engage with the photograph. It's a sloppy image with bad light. They're going to turn the page, and they're not going to spend the requisite time with the image to actually take in what the content is. Uh, Glenna, what, what can still photography do that, um, that video can't do? How is it different? How is it a, a different medium? I've never done video, <laughs> so... Um, well, in storytelling, what, what yeah. can it offer that video uh, can't? I, I am sort of a still photography enthusiast. I, I think it has to do with controlling the pacing. I, I want to choose how long I look at pictures for when, and I think of that as like my primary looking experience. And um, so video has not appealed to me as a storyteller as much. Um, I love other people's videos. <laughs> and I'm glad that you all have the patience to do them. Um, I've been working a lot in a way where I'm trying to sort of isolate objects and ideas and um, pare down the circumstances and I, I don't want it to get lost in the jumble and so I've been looking for stark images and quiet images and different work and trying to see if that can also tell stories. You, you talked about the objects. Can you talk a little bit about your um, the, the objects that you photographed um, that were brought by the... Uh... Sure. Um, so there are a lot of Westerners who have been held hostage by Al-Qaeda and ISIS and other terrorist groups. 
and I went around and met a bunch of them and photographed sort of memorabilia from captivity, the things they carried home. And they carry back a lot of things. I didn't really know what to expect when I started it. I knew some people had some clothes and I knew about a bowl and spoon, but um, I found a lot of pretty interesting objects and uh, including um, a chess set that a bunch of Western hostages who have been held in Raqqa uh, made out of just scraps of cardboard. And um, there's not really a way to show a cell in Raqqa. And we've seen a lot of pictures of torture and people with bruises and cuts and scars. And I knew I didn't really want to do that. And I didn't know I would find a chess set. But I sort of started down that path. And that was what it led to. And Ash, uh, your bedrooms of the fallen, if you can talk about that a little bit. And it's the kind of thing that clearly wouldn't work for video. So what, what are you kind of distilling in, in taking these pictures? I think well, the point of the bedrooms of the fallen was, I think it was a response to all of the work that I had done in Iraq. And in Iraq, we were banned, essentially, from taking pictures of dead and wounded soldiers and Marines. Um, we weren't really banned, but we were asked to stand in front of a group this size and say, in the case that any of you are killed or wounded when we cross the line, um, can you sign here on this dotted line um, to give me permission to take your, and publish your picture? So in 2008, when that rule came into effect, it pretty much banned any type of photography of dead soldiers. Um, so I felt that both the people serving and us as the general public in the United States were being robbed of you know, seeing one of the central realities of war. So the bedrooms was a way of addressing you know, looking at who was serving, but looking at who was dying. Um, and I think that as far as it being a still over it being video, it's something that you needed to sit and look at for a long time. Like I photographed all of these bedrooms in panoramic, in black and white, as a way to sort of even the playing field so you could find objects within these rooms that somehow related to your life. And I'm sure that, you know, there's a way of doing this in film. But I wanted it to be separated from the survivors, you know, separated from the, fam you know, from the brothers and sisters and from the mothers and fathers. I wanted it, you know, most of the work that you see about death is about the people who survive and grieve over the dead person. It's not about the absence. And the bedroom was about the absence. So this was a way of doing it in an absolutely quiet, still, meditative manner. Uh, I want to talk about the preparations that go into um, traveling and working in a hostile environment. You had You've done a lot of work in hostile environments already, um, and you also had a, a colleague who has had even more experience, I imagine, just because of it by age. Um, do you what what kind of uh, groundwork did you do in advance uh, to to get ready for um, your trip to to Libya? I mean, what did you have a, a fixer? Did you have um, people you were talking to, or did you just did you go through hostile environment training, uh, which many of us have to do for insurance reasons, I think. Uh, what, what, what kind of stuff did you do before you left? So I did take hostile environment training, and I did take the risk course. But that was all after I had went through Libya, um, <laughs> which is, should be the other way around. But I, you know, I was living and working in Egypt. And after the Egyptian revolution in Libya happened, there wasn't you know, time or space to really even I didn't imagine it turning into the conflict that it did. You know, at the beginning, everybody thought it was going to be another revolution like Egypt and Tunisia and last, you know, 10 to, to 18 days or something. And, you know, there would be some, you know, firefights, but there wouldn't be anything like what Libya turned into. So that's one of the reasons when I found myself in that I called him because we had worked together in Egypt, and I said, what do I do? And, and as he said, he, you know, there was something he told me that was my mantra the whole time was, you know, do not feel that pressure to rush to the front line when, all the, when journalists are coming back and talking about what they're doing and seeing. You only go there when it's necessary for your story, and you get in and you get out. And that was my hostile environment training before, um, you know, during my time in Libya. Um, which I don't necessarily recommend um, for people to do. Um, and now, you know, I've taken those courses and I've gone back into um, situations and think differently. And I think one of the most important things is you need to take these courses so that you can remain calm and you can really have objectivity when you're in moments that you really need to think and you need to be aware of what's going on. Tim, is there anything that you uh, in your career have decided either in advance or somewhere along the way that that's just not appropriate for me to film? Or is it situational? Can you give an example when you maybe turned your camera away? 
Sure. Um, there's certain situations you can get into where um, the, the situation and the people who are involved in it want you to film it, and they want you to film it for their cause. And so, for example, um, in Central African Republic recently, um, there is something like a genocide happening there right now. And um, they, there is a situation where, um, how do I describe this? They wanted to uh, show that they would, one of the sort of animist, let's say animist non-Muslim, anti-Muslim militia, wanted to show that they would beat and torture and kill one of the, the, the Muslim uh, civilian people. And uh, they wanted to show that to me on camera. And, um, and, uh, and well, that's of course a situation where you should really turn away. But unfortunately there are, you know, that can seem like sexy news to a lot of people. And, and it's, it, I guess at the time you have to make a decision uh, as to your own ethical and moral way of working, whether you shoot or don't shoot. In that case, you uh, didn't feel like it was appropriate to shoot because it would have actually influenced the, what was going on? Would they have done it if you were shooting and not done it? Sure. I mean, I, I'm old fashioned. I believe in that um, being a, a, as an a, a independent observer as much as possible, being distant. I, I don't think that it's possible to be objective, but being, you know, you, you, being subjective is fine, but, but should always not influence the situation. I'm just there to document it and bring it back. Ash, have you ever either seen something and deliberately did not pull the trigger or deleted it from your uh, role after you did take it because you just Never thought? Never delete. I mean, I always keep everything that I have in the can. If I, if I decide not to file it, I've always, decide, I've always said, after one experience at least, that um, that would be a decision that I would make once I had the picture in the can. Um, but I'd never had to not send. You know, I've always felt it's more ethical to send it than not. Um, but I remember, like, with the embedding process, I got very close to one unit from the New York National Guard. And at one point, a guy, an Iraqi um, lieutenant that they were working side by side with, um, was interrogating an al-Qaeda suspect, and he was, like, beating him with this um, extent, like, re retractable baton the police carry. Um, and he pulled out a bayonet and went to stab the guy. And um, Behind me, this New York lieutenant said, you know, Mike, put the knife away. There's a reporter here. I thought I'd shot the picture. I, like, turned around and lied to the lieutenant and said, don't worry, I didn't shoot it. I was looking for the picture that night to send back to the Times, and it wasn't there. So I looked, I thought, like, some son of a bitch has, like, deleted it from my camera when I wasn't looking. So I checked the file numbers, and there was no discrepancy. And I realized that I had unconsciously protected the unit, you know, through becoming so close to them. So that was such a strong wake-up call. But otherwise I shoot. I mean, there's some pretty weird stuff that happens that I don't shoot because I just can't put it in context. Like, I'm around guys who are away from girls for a very long time. <laughs> Shit gets pretty weird. Well, I think, <laughs> I know, but I've also had a similar situation where you have to make a, a decision. So uh, I was embedded for almost a year with these guys and, uh, you know, they're in Iraq and they're, they're losing it. They came over there idealistic thinking, I'm going to defend my country. This is for 9-11, et cetera, et cetera. And they get there and they're like, well, what the hell am I doing here? And so one of the ways they survive is by buying alcohol or having like marijuana sent to them through the post. And um, so one night we went out and they stole a Humvee. This is on like the big military base. And we drove out to some dark corner and there was no camera and they lit up and it was just the best piece of footage. I think it's one of the most amazing scenes I've ever filmed. Of these two kids smoking joints, getting high and just being so honest and so brilliant and so eloquent. And I had to, at the filmmaking process, decide whether to use that scene or not. If I did use it, they would have been kicked out of the military, they would have lost their pensions, the commander, there would have been a hierarchy, so their commander also would have been fired and got into trouble. Maybe this is a, uh, something where they would be court-martialed. And um, at that stage, I had to decide, like, how representative was this of what I was filming? And I decided that these guys were just a small group. Most of the guys were not like getting high every single night, you know? And if you put that in a film, it looks like all the American soldiers do it all the time. And that just wasn't fair. And, you know, you do get close to these guys and they're not the bad guys. These, you know, they're, they're kind of doing their best. Most of them are just sort of 
came from a tough place, and they're in an even tougher place. Glenna, what about you? You, you were just uh, in Liberia. <laughs> were, were there any examples where you? Yeah, I, uh, I did have a couple moments where I didn't take pictures, and kind of for the opposite set of reasons, because I felt like I didn't know the people. Um, I was at uh, the MSF clinic in Monrovia on a Sunday afternoon, and I was waiting for some survivors to be released to photograph them. And I was meeting this one woman in this one area, and I went over to talk to her. And while I was talking to her on the side, this other woman was just like crying really loudly. And I looked over, and she was there with her maybe two or three year old son. And he was sort of convulsing a little bit and like not doing well. And I was sort of continuing to talk to the woman who I was supposed to be talking to and sort of watching this out of the corner of my eye. And then the kid stopped moving and she just started screaming at the top of her lungs and just wailing this like painful, awful sound. And I didn't know her, I didn't know her name. I'd never spoken to her, I didn't know her son's name. And I felt like taking the picture was the wrong thing to do. And I didn't take it. And um, if I had known her, if I had talked to her an hour earlier and I had said, you know, what's your son's name? What's your name? Maybe I'd had that experience. I would have felt like I had her permission, but I didn't. I was not someone she knew and I didn't need to intrude on that moment. And maybe that photo would have been amazing and changed something, but more likely it would sit on my computer and maybe the Wall Street Journal would run it and maybe they wouldn't. And I feel okay about the choice I made. What about you? Was there ever a time when you uh, turned your camera away? Not because someone asked you to, but because you didn't feel it was right? Yeah, I mean, there. I think there was a couple times, and specifically, I mean, with this film, um, after the revolution was over, and, you know, they're sitting around, you can see Hamid, you know, gains weight, and they all kind of look a bit distressed and look a lot older. And really, what happened, there was alcohol and drug abuse rampant alcohol and drug abuse after the revolution was over. It was happening in small amounts during the revolution, but once it was finished, I mean, this is what everybody turned to. And, you know, that could have been a, an interesting way, a way that people could have maybe understood it better, but it would have completely destroyed them beyond how it would have added anything into the film. That is just against you know their religion. It's against what their families believe. It was hard enough to even show them smoking. They would get angry with that. Um, so, and again, it's that trust that you build, and and they know that um, you you know they would be out there not fighting, make, driving me around on days, knowing that I was going to tell the story. I mean, but there is moments that I did include that maybe they didn't want me to include at that moment because I knew that they would actually help the viewer understand what Hamid and Tarek went through. For instance, in the hospital scene, the camera's at a different angle at one point, and that's because they had asked me to stop, but it was the first moment that there was complete, honest emotion and exchange between the two of them. And I knew that that is when you realize like what has actually happened, Tarek and Hamid, and Hamid also understands it, so that I thought that was a really important thing, and we discussed this a lot, to keep it in or not, but... Um, well, how did you decide? So yeah. he told you not to film it, that you had already spent a lot of time and built their trust. Was that a betrayal? You know, I think, um, you know, they had me, they pushed me down, you know, it was, it was filming, I had no clue what I was gonna capture, and, and the, the first couple drafts of the film, I wasn't in there. And, awesome. yeah, the, the moment in the hospital scene where, him, where Tark tells him, you know, I don't feel anything from the waist down. Mm -hmm. And um, there was, there, there are things that are still edited out from a lot of those moments, but to finally see Hamid and Tarek having that moment where there's that complete understanding, I think it, it became so much more than just a moment where Hamid is kind of you know, making fun of Tarek again. It became Sometimes an honest you have moment. To act like you maybe feel you have better judgment at the time, like you've decided, look, you may not like this, but you agreed to let me film you, and I believe that showing these things are uh, important and will share the story. Because if you don't, you, you're just watching a bunch of like, Arabs running around killing each other. So if you don't put in some human emotion, something that we can relate to as a white guy from Brooklyn, how can I relate to these kids? How can I relate to these? And what was one of the problems, actually, was um, when Rachel first came back with the footage, I was like, 
how are we going to make a film about these two assholes? Because <laughs> they were so, like, sort of, like, they were, like, teasing each other. They were just such young, juvenile, um, you know, were they smart? I can't tell because they're so, sort of, uh, and, and it, it, took some, it took some sort of time to, and how can we redeem these characters from their sort of, their bad, sort of, young, young man behavior? And, um, and, and, and make them like worthwhile, put them into a 90 minute film. And think moments like that of deep emotion were obviously had to be in. Now you certainly don't want to cede any editorial control to your subjects, that, that doesn't work and I imagine you never agreed to anything like that. But did you, did you mention to Tarek that you were gonna put it in? Did you give him a heads up? We discussed a lot of things afterwards and I mean, but you can't really, we were still interviewing Tarek um, up till two months before we finished the film. And, so, and you still didn't know what was going to be you. So you, you really, I think, because of that trust and because you're trying to, it's, it's honest, it's real, and you know, it's not about ruining that person's life. And I think if it, it actually helps do, all the time that you spend and all the time that they gave to me and I gave to them, I think that's why, you know, decide to, to leave those moments in. Um, I want to, right before maybe opening the floor to uh, opening, uh, getting some questions from the audience, um, I wanted to see, uh, and this is a pretty broad question, but um, when you're actually depicting Bang Bang, when you're showing people firing guns and you've got music playing, um, wh where, I, where I work, obviously we, we come under fire sometimes for maybe using that to tickle a part of your brain that is, um, you know, titillated rather than informed. We, uh, and, and I don't necessarily agree with that criticism, but it's a judgment call for the filmmakers always. And, and I wanted to know, um, I guess, in your film, was there concern that you were going to make it look fun and funny, especially with Hamid, who clearly is a bit of an adrenaline junkie or at least had a lot of bravado and, and was kind of a cool guy and he talked about Call of Duty so there was this conflation of video games in real life in his life. I mean, yeah, we did. That was uh, what we want to do on purpose at the beginning because that's really how they were living this war and that's how their object, you know, that's how they believed their world or what the world around them was. and. You had to set that up in, in an honest way to really show how it changed and how reality kind of came in. But especially with um, the overture of 1812, I mean, we talked about this a lot. <laughs> you can go into that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for me, that was, that was a no-brainer. I mean, just it, it, it's, it, this is what's happening in his head. Like, that's my version of what's happening. He's probably thinking something more of, like, Rappy gangster. Listen to more Eminem. Yeah, so. I, mean, I was going to say Eminem, yeah. but I yeah. wasn't sure if I was too expensive too old. to put that in the film. So yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And, and, and but but to me, this was a way of representing the the way that he sort of saw himself as this glorified. <clears throat> it was his first day on the battlefield, and he felt like a fucking hero, and. Um, that's what he was imagining. Come check this out. Look at me. Look at my cap on sideways. I'm like, I'm untouchable. And, and, and there's a re if you don't put the music in and you don't sort of emphasize that aspect, it's not necessarily always clear what the character's thinking. So I think it's a slight balance between, well, there's no narration in this film. And we didn't ask him about that. And, but more importantly, he couldn't talk to that. He didn't know what he was doing. He, firstly, he's super young. Secondly, he has no experience. He doesn't know, he's not an eloquent, super eloquent person in, in that sort of a way. If he could have described exactly how he felt, then we wouldn't have needed to do that, but he couldn't. And so we do that and we show that. Uh, anyone have any questions? Yeah. Um, oh. um, okay. So you went through dozens of characters and then you chose two um, that you wanted a viewer to look at and to relate to and follow throughout the film and grow attached to. Did you guys have a backup plan if one, if one or both of those characters died in month two? Like were you shooting other footage of other characters just in case? No, I mean it got to a point where after I made that decision it was, it was Hamid and Tarek and it was, you know, that was something that I was 
deathly scared about every single day, especially when you know, there'd be days where they'd leave me at the field hospital and then they'd go a bit further, they'd go fight, and they would come pick me up at the end of the day. And being in the field hospital and every single ambulance that would pull up, I was so worried that they would be in there, especially when the days got a bit too long and they'd usually pick me up before dusk and now it's been, you know, the sun is set for an hour and they still haven't picked me up. And um, I, I never, I guess I never really thought. It's kind of like, it's funny that you talk about it that way. It makes it sound like a game, like a computer game. So if this character gets taken out, well, we just get a new life. But, but that's the film. You know? That would have been, that that would have been, been the, the film. film. Right, that would be... You know, it, then it would have been, you know, how does one have to deal with that? I mean, Hamid almost did die. Tark almost did die. And a lot of these young kids in the film did die that I was actually filming on the peripheral of Hamid and Tark. And that is what happens in war. And so that would have been a very honest, you know, story if that did happen. The alternative is that they just turn out to be boring or they don't do anything or that's they a scare, that's that's what you worry about actually yeah. is that they don't do anything I don't worry about that no because if that's what it is then that's what it is right and and you can make a great story out of that you know and um, in some ways Tarek who is constantly like cock blocked as far as like getting to the front line goes uh, that's almost what happened to him and he pushed it and he pushed it and he pushed it and then he went too far he didn't follow the signs. He didn't follow his instincts. He tried. To, he wanted too hard to go past that line, and um, and that's what happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi. I just wanted to thank you and congratulate you for being here and answer the questions. Um, questions about Tarek. You kind of at the end. You, you feel bad for him. You feel sad. You feel sorry. And I I want to know that at at a, at a higher level, can we also feel happy for him did he get he got he did exactly what he set out to do I have to be careful how you say this without being insensitive he consciously made the decision he wanted to go over there he wanted to fight for his country he wanted to go to the front lines he got all of that the rebels took control they overthrew he came home he was obviously physically impaired but did he get what he was, did he, did he achieve that higher level of fulfillment that I think that he was originally searching for? No, I mean, it's, um, there's, I hope one day that he does, um, but there continued to be a spiral um, of Tark. The emotional scars, I think, are a lot worse than the physical um, for Tark. And um, right now he's currently actually in Libya. He went back about two weeks before the fighting ha began again. Um, in this August. So he's in Libya, and Libya is not in a good place at all. And so right now, I don't think there's very many people that went through this war that feel incredibly positive. Everybody's still trying to push and hope that maybe there's a better future. But I don't think he's come to a point where he's completely content with what he went through. Well. I think one of the things I loved about the film, though, is how it represented this, you know, millennia old story of young men and war. Like us having seen our parents or our grandparents or uncles and go off to war and come back troubled, you know, having experienced great trauma. And then you as a young man, a young woman, feeling a draw to go off and do exactly the same as what they did, even though you've got hard evidence in your own family that it goes badly. I think one of the successes, if you will, of going off to war is getting messed up and coming home messed up and realizing that, oops, you know? And I think that this film, like it rung, it rung true to an experience that I understood very intimately and many of my friends do. And I mean, it, it, I've said it to you, but it reminds me of the red badge of courage, you know? Like did he, did he um, achieve what he set out, set out to, do I and mean, he did, you know. But is that a good thing? No. It's a good question. No one's ever said that before. Everyone always thinks like, "Wow, what a disaster." Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, well, we're talking. I guess, unless uh, if we have time, uh, we're talking about how he handled his return. Um, and among journalists, it's not, you don't want to 
bring the attention to yourself, um, and that's sometimes a bad thing. But uh, when, you're, when you are in these areas and, and absorbing all these stories and filming people and uh, seeing people die in their mother's arms, um, obviously that has an effect on, on us as human beings. Um, what's, how, how do you cope when you return? What's, what, do you have a go-to Do you have a go-to way of handling that grief when you get home? I just got back like two days ago. So yeah. um, n no, I think I'm pretty bad at it most of the time. I'm trying to be better at it. Do you I, bad at it mean do you just withdraw for a while? Or? Um, the thing is that every time I get back, I still have like a lot of work to do. And so you can't, so like I'm, you're going through this huge, I just, you know, had like a, I don't know, like a 70 degree temperature drop, but you know, like I'll be like, oh my goodness, I have to send those pictures right away. I have to edit this after that. And I'm trying to sort of, um, take a little more time to sort of just exhale before I get back into the work. So um, I'm just trying to do that a bit. We'll see how it goes. Ashley talked about how you related a little bit. What, what kind of, how do you yourself cope when you return? Well, I've been going to places like that for a long time. Um, but I live in New York, so it's pretty easy to have a therapist and talk about, to another therapist at a dinner party about that therapist. <laughs> <laughs> um, I ride a bike a lot and try to, uh, I guess, express any fury or anger I have at society at large. Taxi drivers. I occasionally beat the shit out of people. <laughs> That's less and less now. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 try to, I try to talk about it, which is not easy. Like, I grew up in a society in Australia where it's not normal to talk about how you're feeling. Um, so I'm trying to learn how to express it, write it down, and then you know, let it manifest in safer ways than getting in fights. I don't know if you have families, but I don't know if you, if you, if you, are there, you don't want to burden your family with your experiences. Who do you talk to if, if that's not an option? You want to protect the people who love you and worry about you. So then who is it that you can talk to? Do you talk to other reporters? Do you talk to shrinks? Do you, who do you talk to? Yeah, definitely other reporters if you can, other people who have been through those sort of I things. I call you a friend, by the way, I call you another reporter. Yes, <laughs> colleagues, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, I can't be as honest as Ashley in my response about how to deal with it. I pretty much just repress everything and drink a lot. Okay, it's really, <laughs> I'm like, such a fucking cliche. <laughs> Um, I guess, you know, when there's been moments, I, I, I always try to handle it right away if I can. For some reason, I, I write you know, a crazy letter down to try to understand why I just filmed what I filmed and the purpose of it. And if I'm angry, I, for instance, you know, when you see the little boy that was killed and his, you know, his bloody sandal. And I was so angry when I came home that day from, from shooting because there was nobody there covering this. And I felt everybody had forgotten about Libya and nobody was in Misrata anymore. And I just got on Twitter. And I just went <laughs> crazy on Twitter <laughs> and just like told everybody off on Twitter. And then, then I felt better um, <laughs> because I just got it out. Um, but, you know, we're all... The, you know, the, I was when I was in Syria, and there was a, this really uncomfortable moment. And these, you know, they had killed twelve of these young boys. And, you know, in, the, in these FSA soldiers, and this family really wanted to show the protagonist that I was filming in Syria this this body of um, this boy that had been killed. And it, and they made they wanted me to film this, and I did not want to film it because I didn't think it had any purpose, and I didn't think it would change. You know. I didn't think it would be used, basically, because it was, it was too intense to look at. And I have just felt kind of destroyed after that day. And I wrote a whole big note. And, and, but it turns out that that exact moment was used, and only a moment of it, but everything around that moment was used in a film, and it actually works. And so that helped me understand that you do have to capture these, you know, these things that are horrible and you have to sit behind your camera, which is one of the things that also saves you because you just, you're doing your job and this is kind of this barrier. Um, yeah, but for me, I just have to handle it the, mo after, the moment after I go through it when it's possible to really be okay with it by the time I come back. You mentioned the camera is kind of a shield and I, I understand that, but are there times where any of you felt like 
you um, needed to put it down and intervene, whether it's help some pick, pick someone up or whatever it is, um, at what point do you stop being an observer and, and become um, part of it? Has, have you had that encounter? Sure. I think you have it all the time. Yeah. I think it happens. I mean, that's we're, we're filming. We're rarely filming like a, a happy moment or a really. I mean, we do. There are positive moments, but the majority of what we do are, are moments of conflict and turmoil, and 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 so every day it's a decision to say, well, I believe if I, as uncomfortable as it may be for the subject or the person that I'm filming, I have to believe that capturing this moment on the camera and then taking it back and distributing it and showing it is greater than what I could do as an individual without it, just with my own hands. I don't know how true that is, but... There's always usually somebody else who's more trained and better equipped than yeah. you are anyway. Yeah, that's true. You know, I think that question became, you know, sort of prominent after that Pulitzer Prize winning picture of the, um, you know, vulture next to the young boy. Um, and that was a rare case where there was actually very few other people around to help. I mean, it was, it was next to an aid center, given, except he still didn't pick up the kid. Now, I think that, you know, I've, I've never been in a situation where I was more equipped to care for the person that was injured or sick than, you know, the person, than anybody else around me. You know, I'm, in many ways, I'm dead weight trying to help in a situation like that. Right, you. Uh, you do what you can when you can. And, you know, you do your job the rest of the time. Well, any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Um, hello. First of all, thanks for putting the touching moment in the movie because I, I can't even imagine the movie without it. Um, actually, what I noticed uh, was that there were a lot of male characters. How does it feel uh, to be a woman surrounded by all these male characters that wants to feel like they're heroes and stuff? I'm sure this is like the question that everybody asks. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I think it's um, it's different in every single scenario for, you know, in this instance, in this time in Libya, journalists were, you know, had a lot more freedom. They were, you know, they were, they felt necessary for the situation, I think, to a lot of the Libyans to help get their story out, to get the no-fly zone and to, you know, to keep disseminating news because Libya had been completely out of people's, you know, minds for four decades. And... I, n I never really felt um, that being a woman was a, as large of an issue in Libya during this time as I have in, in other places. Granted, it was difficult sometimes. At one point, I got kicked out of my hotel because I was coming, you know, I was having to live young Libyan men hours, which is like they would get up at three in the afternoon and then they would go to bed at four in the morning. And if I was going to film them, I'd have to be up when they were up. And so I would be leaving, you know, this hotel with different members of, you know, the Libyan youth, the Libyan Shabab, and they were, they didn't really get this. And so I got kicked out of the hotel and I had to move in with these guys, which was the craziest couple weeks um, where you didn't really get to take a shower for, you know, weeks as well. Um, because they're, you know, you're living inside of a, of a troop of these young men. Um, but there's been many other times that, you know, you do have to disguise who you are as a woman, um, working in Syria, working in other places where you really don't have that option or you, that protection that I actually did feel at time, most of the time when I was in Libya. I don't know. You want to take a jihadi mode? My jihadi, yeah. Um, you know, also, as I was saying earlier, when um, going out to the front line, you know, they're, at one point they started leaving me at the field hospital. They go out and fight and then they pick me up. It was mainly one of the main reasons was because the, the guys out on the front line asked them to quit bringing me out because I was ruining the jihadi mood. Um, <laughs> so that kind of, you know, I had to focus on other things and film other things during that time. So that is the difference between they're going to take out, um, you know, a guy compared to one of us. That would be a great Twitter handle, like Jihadi, jihadi. Buzzkill. <laughs> yeah, Jihadi Buzzkill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you all are traveling really far to, to real dangerous places to tell these stories and, and bring them to light. And there's still a sense that no one gives a shit. 
around the world. Um, is there a sense of futility? I mean, how, how do you how do you keep doing what you do without feeling like it's a complete waste? Uh, yeah. I think that in the division of labor, this is our job. And um, you just have to do this part. And you can only care about doing this part. And if you're attached, for me, if I'm attached to the results, then I've already failed because I'm never going to change that much. I'm never going to do that much. I can only do what I can do. And I feel very aware of my limitations. And I just have to believe in that process enough to believe that if I do my part, other people will do theirs. Oh, I feel very much like an advocate or a lobbyist. Uh, so I really get very strongly behind stories. So I'm more interested that in the end result than I'm actually in producing the pictures. Um, so I get really, really impassioned, let's say, uh, about how the work is received, how widely it's broadcast. Um, so it really depends on a whole variety of factors as to whether or not I feel like it's futile or not. Like, what side of the bed I wake up on, how cold it is, whether I've got enough warm clothes to stay warm. If I haven't, then I'm in a foul mood and I think that it's the end of the world and it sucks and I haven't done my job. But, you know, if I've got a sweater, it's great and there's great purpose to the work that I'm doing and I really believe in this and I think that I can change and, and help people understand to, you know, provide positive change. But it's totally m mood based for me. <laughs> How do you feel right now? <laughs> Inside. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't feel aware of my limitations at all. I think the, you know, the possibilities are endless. And sure, it's a struggle to tell like a, a story that isn't necessarily uplifting immediately. Or yeah, it's a tough. You know, wow, I got this film about Africa. <laughs> Who's going to watch it? And everyone leaves. Like, it's, it's hard. And, and the trick is always, how do you find a way to relate it? And in some ways, our job is to try and trick you into watching it. Yeah. And, and, and so you're talking about the aesthetics of taking a photo. Um, this is one thing. And there's a fine line. Sometimes things are you know, deceptive. And, and it's hard to tell. One of the powers of video, actually, um, beyond stills and writing is there's a certain truth to it or at least the audience believes there's a certain truth to it that when you when you when you see it on film it really happened and so we have a big advantage in that and the, the, of course i believe in not abusing that power there's a lot of filmmakers who do and they will abuse that and tell you that this is true when it's not really true and well that's that's, that's one thing but um but the idea is we get to make a film. So we get to make uh, with three acts, with a dramatic arc and two characters that we try and tell you, like, even though they're assholes, if you watch The Rushes, they're actually really cool guys. And we're going to choose these bits that show you, like, actually, these guys are really insightful and these guys are really the important characters that will help you understand the situation. And, uh, and, and that's one of the powers of a, a film. So, and I think now it's, it's even more. I mean, it just, People, there's more and more documentaries. There's more and more ways of making them. People are ready to watch almost anything now. Shaky, out of focus, whatever, it doesn't matter. Rachel, isn't the ultimate goal, though, to get someone to do something about it? What you showed you know, is complete chaos and, and the fact that all these people are dying for a cause that's murkier and murkier every day. Um, what, what is the ultimate goal? Do you want people to get angry and demand their legislators do something? Or what, what's the ultimate goal here? I mean, I think every film has a different ultimate goal. Um, for this, I mean, for me, to begin with, being from North Dakota, and the whole reason I wanted to go into journalism and do this work is because I really just wanted to bring something back to pop these bubbles of, you know, the not really caring about anything besides, like, the football team. And, um, you know, I didn't really... I went beyond um, that, definitely, but... Um, I totally lost my train of thought, too. <laughs> What's the what are you hoping to accomplish right. with the film? Um, I mean, mainly with this film, the whole purpose is there is, if, if I wouldn't have stuck it out and spent as much time I did on the ground, there wouldn't be this visual document. And it just wouldn't exist. You would have a bunch of, of random conflict footage that would be really hard to decipher. And there wouldn't have been something that would come out that people can look at this and learn from. And you know, hopefully there'll be another film and you can piece it together on how something happened and they won't forget 
what happened at this point in, in their lives. So a lot of this, even though I, I wanted to make it for people outside of Libya, it's also for people that went through this or, or Libyans themselves who I've met a lot of and said, you know, this film needs to be shown in Libya because it will help people remember what we went through. And I think, as Ashley was saying, it is a testament to the way war has always been fought. And hopefully people will see this and be like, okay, this has happened before and it will happen again. And maybe something will click in somebody's head and they'll remember that this is, there is this outcome and it's not, it's not a good thing. Great. Any final question? Oh, good. Oh, one final question. Um, firstly, Rachel, congratulations on the film. Um, I guess my question could uh, be addressed by others in the panel as well, uh, which is uh, how does, does it aid or obstruct access? Uh, what effect does it have on access being a white foreigner reporting from conflict zones in the global south? Um, does it necessarily help? Does it, does it hinder you? Uh, I would say it's tough. Yeah, it's tough. Like, uh, I spent a lot of time driving through Baghdad and driving through Iraq and Mosul, lying on the back seat, lying down with a, with a blanket over my head. Um, you know, I can grow a beard, but I'm always going to look like this guy. I'm not going to be able to blend in ever. And that's, and that's more and more of a problem, as you've seen, with like, our colleagues who have been captured and killed recently in, uh, in Syria and Iraq. And, um, and, um, and, that, and that's a powerful thing that they've been doing is it's making us and me afraid to go back to places like this. They're, they're, they are owning the story as a result of that. So how else do you do it? And, and, and who's funding it? And does that mean like if I don't go, do I find a brown guy that I can pay and go and risk his life? It's, it's tough. It's tough now in those things, situations. I think one of the difficulties is, I mean, we always work with like very, you know, expert fixers, which is kind of like an assistant, and they both um, speak the local language, but more importantly, teach you local customs and, you know, ways in which to interact, correct ways in which to interact with people and, and you know, show dignity in what they're doing and, and understand that. Um, but I think that, I mean, one of the conflicts that I've always seen is, you know, while my fixer could probably do a better job than I could photographing these stories that we're getting involved in, because he is from this place and he understands this place, he might have family involved in the story. He hasn't got the contacts that I've got, you know, in London or Paris or New York. Um, and so I know, like, at my photo agency, we're trying to bridge that a little tiny bit. We have this mentor program. You know, we sit each year in this room, um, 19 of us, and have this annual general meeting, and it's like, 19 gray-haired white guys with um, bad bladders, you know. Um, like, it's totally lame. We're like, this is, this is a problem. So we've branched our mentor program, um, which is like a mini seven, in which we give them all of, you know, our full address book. We make the introductions to the editors that we have had these relationships with for 20 plus years. And, you know, so Ali Arkady is working in Iraq. He's extremely talented, um, but he hasn't got the address book. And now he does. You know, so now he's in front of all these top editors. and. Hopefully, it empowers the guys who are actually living the story, you know, to be publishing the story rather than it being controlled by, you know, some some dude in New York. Thank you for the work, but calling me and sending me off. Well, thanks everyone for sticking around. Uh, it was a great conversation, and uh, thanks to Kickstarter for screening this wonderful movie. <laughs>